Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 8th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. I'm the chair and I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Molly Burnham? Here. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Present. Ms. Lewani Present. Here. Ms. Susan Ross. Present. Mr. Edward Jackson. And Mayor David Marcos. Present. You're honoring our forum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of uh, members that are uh, absent, one who's coming a little bit later. Um, so we'll begin the meeting tonight with the public comment period. Um, we have one person signed up tonight so far, uh, Renee Wetstein, and I would ask you to approach the podium. And um, if you can just state your name and address for the record, and I'll have the three-minute timer. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll wait till you introduce yourself Thank before you. I start it. Uh, Renee Westine, I live at 222 Elm Street in Northampton. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I was quiet for a while because I was pretty depressed about the school start time. And two reasons brought me back here. One, on the... The Daily Hampshire Gazette on Tuesday, February 27th, um, Jim Bridgman, who's the beloved Latin teacher at the high school who does a look back at the Gazette, put in a proposal to, this is 10 years ago, a proposal to push back morning start times at the high school, um, Northam High School it will be the topic of discussion tonight when a committee of parents and school officials meet at JFK Middle School, students at Northampton High School currently start at 7.30. And then I've been watching the news of all the students talking about gun control and I feel like obviously it's not the same thing as gun control but it's an issue that seems not to um, happen even though everyone agrees it's the right <coughs> thing to do it's just the logistics of it and there has to be a way to solve this um, I meet continually with students and families that kids are depressed and anxious and it shouldn't be that just that you're in 11th grade or 12th grade and you're just super bright and you can take two classes at Smith or you opt out and you do GCC and HCC or you actually leave the high school. So I am suggesting at, you know, next semester we implement kids can, any kid that shows up at the high school, they could opt out of first period class. And what that means is they would have to take an online class that's can you know obviously be approved there's so many online classes that can be taken they could have an internship I am willing to volunteer and help students and I know there's a lot of other people like me that are empty nesters that would love to help students and kind of adopt a student to work with them so there's a lot of options and instead of thinking like this can't be done what's working now isn't working so that's what I'm just asking you it's passed before it was 7-2 it passed um, and then there's an issue with the busing, and the, it's always the logistics. So let's let's do right for these kids, and I, you know, these these kids are just tired. So thank you very much, and I know you guys are all working hard, but I think this is I think this is possible and doable. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, um, so then that will conclude the public comment period. Um, are there any announcements this evening? Okay, I appear to have two announcements. I wasn't sure whose hand was up first, so I'll just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will go Rock, quickly. Paper, scissors. I, no, it's okay. I just um, I know the committee knows, and I just want to make sure that the public also knows that the P, the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School request for expansion is going to be considered at the next um, DESE board meeting, which is March 27th at 8:30 in the morning in Malden. Um, my understanding from the superintendent is that the um, <coughs> interim commissioner is recommending that it be denied again, but they are allowed to raise it again. We have resubmitted our letters that we wrote a couple months ago. So those have been, I've let a couple parents also who I know who have written letters, uh, let them know so they can also resubmit. Um, and uh, you know, I cannot attend for public comment purposes that day, but others can. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was kept abreast of that. Hey, Ms. Fallon. Um, so I'm sure most of you know this, but um, so the MASC has allowed one representative on the MIAA basketball committee, and this year I've been lucky enough to fulfill that position. Um, and um, it's been really exciting and interesting, oddly enough. Um, and um, 
this year the girls and the boys team were both seated first um, in the tour in the state tournament and the girls both teams got a bye the first round and the girls had a really exciting win over Pittsfield on Monday um, and will be playing in the finals um, on Saturday at UMass at 545 um, against um, Tantasqua. Um, and then the boys um, also got to buy the first round and they are playing in about 10 minutes against Chicopee. Um, and I'm sure we all, including Miss Hennessy, wish them the best. <laughs> 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 if they make it to the finals, if they win, the winner of that tonight's game plays Taconic at 7, also at UMass on Saturday. So I didn't realize just how much time and effort and how many volunteers were involved in putting on this tournament. So I do appreciate that and I hope that everyone will go out and support the girls and the boys if they make it into the finals. Um, and then the other announcement was as the <coughs> NEF liaison, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Northampton Education Foundation spelling bee is Wednesday, March 21st here at JFK. Um, the doors open at five, there's food available for purchase, and the event starts at 6 p.m. So I hope everyone will come out and help support our school. Okay. Um, I actually am gonna make an announcement on behalf of uh, the vice chair, who's also the Ward 4 representative, um, uh, he's will be coming a little bit later. On Wednesday, March 14th, uh, Bridge Street School will hold its annual science fair uh, from 6 to 7.30 uh, in, the, in the Bridge Street School gym. Uh, the science fair is a unique event in that it not only highlights scientific thinking and problem solving by Bridge Street students, it requires students to use what they have learned across the curriculum in presenting their projects, including in the areas of math, language arts, science, technology, and art. Bridge Street School has about 55 student participants this year who are excited to showcase their work uh, for families, peers, um, school committee members, uh, Superintendent Provost, and many others. Uh, Bridge Street is thrilled to be partnering with the following wonderful local community members and organizations. Uh, the Smith College STEM Student Ambassadors, uh, led by Thomas Krilinski of Smith College's Clark Science Center and the Jandon Center for Community Engagement will work with children and visitors in engaging hands-on science activities. The Northampton High School Robotics Team, the Devil Bots, will showcase their amazing robot for fair visitors. Uh, and the Northampton Education Foundation board members, Marty Wall and Andrew Boulay, will act as judges for the fair. Um, so again, it's a great collaboration uh, between Bridge Street and these other organizations and the community is invited to come and see this uh, great event. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, we'll now move into uh, recommended actions. And we have a consent agenda this evening that includes the approval of minutes of the Budget and Property Subcommittee meeting of February 12th, 2018. Two field trip requests, uh, Bridge Street fifth grade going to Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts, March 26th through the 29th of 2018. Ryan Road fifth grade going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut, June 15th, 2018. Um, I would appreciate a uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Um, next, we will move to a uh, report from our student representative, Elena <coughs> And I, I know Ms. Fallon has already uh, taken some of your report. No, I checked with her first. <laughs> she did, and I okay. appreciate it. Um, <coughs> good evening. Uh, in response to the recent school shooting in Parkland, Florida, as well as the history of gun violence in the United States, um, some students at Northampton High have organized a few events to show solidarity with students in Parkland, as well as voice their opinions on legislative change. On March 14th at 10 a.m., uh, some students have planned to walk out of classes as part of the National School Walkout. There will be a rally in front of Northampton High School. This is an event for students only and is being co-sponsored by groups such as the Feminist Collective, Gender Sexuality Alliance, Environmental Club, Young Democrats Club, Teen Advocacy Group, and the Student Union. Students will not be disciplined as long as they promptly return to class after the event. Teachers, um, in accordance with Dr. Provost's guidance, um, will continue instructing classes for those students who do not wish to participate in the walkout. Um, these same groups are in the process of organizing the Pioneer Valley March for Our Lives, which will be held on Saturday, March 24th at noon. It will begin at Northampton High School and conclude with a rally at City Hall. 
This past weekend, members of Northampton High Theater traveled to Franklin High School to perform the Hedda Variations at the Mass Educational Theater Guild Festival. Although they did not advance in competition, uh, NHS freshman Adelaide Green won an, an acting award, and NHS senior Cody Guild won an award for sound design, so congratulations to the both of them. Um, on March 15th and 16th at 7 p.m. and March 17th at 5 p.m., uh, this group will be performing a home run of the play at Northampton High School. Additionally, Functionless, the Northamptons, and a one-prop review will be performing. It looks like it's going to be quite the display of NHS performing arts and artistic talent, so make sure you all attend. And if you have any questions or the public has questions about exact timing, I would refer you to Ms. Burnham, who has more information about that. And then I want to thank Ms. Fallon for so lovely <laughs> representing Northampton High Athletics. Um, and just want to wish luck to all the student athletes heading off to competition this weekend. Excellent, thank you. So we'll now um, move into the rest of the reports and recommendations, and I believe I'm going to <coughs> ask that we take up um, item D, because uh, Principal Agna is here. Um, this is a first reading on a request to name uh, the Jackson Street Greenhouse in honor of Mary Bates. So I'll recognize. Oh, oh yeah. Never mind. It's, it's the it's problem. On TV. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think I, I you got <laughs> I hope you got the um, nomination letter that I wrote. And just to say for the public, um, Ms. Bates has been a teacher at our school for years. She started as a student teacher. She changed careers from being an attorney and went to the Elms and got her uh, certificate and did a student teaching in fourth grade at our school. And immediately we saw the potential for a very fine teacher. Unfortunately, a year or two later, there was an opening for her to teach first grade, which she's been doing. Um, as you know, she's pretty dogged in our school garden project that began at our school, but has taken off in all of the elementary schools. And she's been responsible for many grants written through NEF and the Community Foundation. And she has also been responsible for really getting everyone enthused and engaged in the project so that it is a big part of our science curriculum now in our school and in the district. And then she decided that we needed a greenhouse at our school. And it wasn't just a little teeny greenhouse, it's a really major greenhouse that it will be heated and will allow us to have you know, growing things all year long so that we can maybe eventually be self-sustaining, <laughs> who knows, but uh, that was a big project. It really it cost a lot of money. It was a project that we thought we could actually build with volunteer help. It turned out it was much more complicated. Um, but she just stayed with it, and she came in every weekend and allowed the volunteers to come and build it, and then enlisted professionals to finish it. And she's retiring <coughs> in June, which is sad for us, she has said that she will be a part of the garden afterwards as a sort of a consultant with the teachers. But we thought there would be no more fitting way to honor her with, but in naming the greenhouse after her. Um, it's odd to name things after people. I know that because <laughs> <laughs> we've had something named after me while I'm still here. <laughs> but it, it really it's helps. It really keeps everyone focused on the people who in our neighborhood who make our school work and she doesn't know about this she may know now <laughs> I, I really would love it if you would approve for us to make it the Mrs. Bates greenhouse from that from whenever we get approval to do that before she leaves okay thank you um, are there any uh, questions or comments about this as you know, we have to take multiple readings every on time. these things. So, um, Do I come every time? It'll probably, no, you don't have to. Um, yeah, it'll probably take us till June to do that. I mean, July. I forget. July. July. Okay. Yeah, July. July. So, okay. If we, do we can it, have a sort of a mock me, ceremony. What's that? If we do it at the If we do it at the next second. meeting, yeah. So we, we've got to do six readings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, six readings. So um, we'll get there. So we have a... When she leaves, we can at least let her know. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. In sure, this Susan. case, are we allowed to propose having two readings on the same night in this case? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. But or three. <laughs> <laughs> Marathon of readings. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you need to do, but I, I just hope that we'd be able to have some sort of ceremony. Yeah. I mean, we can, uh, I'm not really sure I'll turn to the rules and policy folks. Uh, we just we've been doing this for the lead school we've been doing six readings for I, I, yeah, for <laughs> Julie Clark's yeah for Julie Clark it's a secret which is it's a also secret. a secret it's a secret <laughs> and the baseball field and Jim too Maya, Jim, Maya, Jim Mayas too okay. oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so um okay. but if I think if the timing were such we could possibly waive the fifth the sixth reading or something and just do five um we'll I, figure it out We'll figure it out. Okay. We'll get it done before then. Before she actually leaves our Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. before she finds out. <laughs> <laughs> so is that, we'll, we'll work that out at the end? Sounds good. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we'll move, is Kara here? No, Candy's going to be doing it. Oh, Candy is. Okay, great. So we're going to move up to uh, number B again, or letter B, uh, vote to authorize the football co-op with Hopkins Academy. Um, and I believe, uh, Candy, you'll be speaking to this. Yes. Uh, Ms. Dupree was scheduled to be here, but she is at the boys' basketball game tonight that was rescheduled. So she sends her regards. Um, the first is to ask you to reauthorize the football co-op with Hopkins Academy that we've had in the past. Okay. So moved. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion uh, made and seconded to um, authorize the co-op uh, for football with Hopkins Academy. Any discussion or questions? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next is a vote. This is a gift from the North um, Northampton Athletic Boosters. Uh, estimated $10,000 uh, to the athletics department for a baseball batting cage. Yes, they're actually looking at putting a new cage in. The batting cage that we have now dates back to 2002, and at that point it wasn't new. It was kind of put together from things that were around the district. So the NABC has offered to donate $10,000 for a new batting cage, which will also include an artificial turf floor so that it can actually be used or, or stand up to the use it gets by multiple groups around town. Um, this would include some installation work by our own grounds crew to try and keep the cost down. Is there a motion to accept that gift? Motion to accept gift. Okay. Second. <laughs> is there a second? second? Okay, there's a second. Um, so there's a motion made and seconded to accept this gift from NABC. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the gift is accepted. Um, moving ahead uh, to E, we have another gift. This is um, Malvern Instruments Incorporated via the Northampton High School PTO and it's $3,000 to the robotics team. Yeah, this is a donation that we get from Malvern each year. Unfortunately, they had converted this year to only doing ACH transfers, which don't work well for us. So the PTO agreed to be sort of a middle person for us, and they accepted the donation from Malvern, and then they're turning around and donating it back to us for use by the robotics team. Okay. Is there a motion to accept that gift? Motion to accept the gift. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, and uh, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that gift is accepted. Okay, so we've gone through the gifts, and so now we'll move into the presentation of the FY19 budget book. And um, for folks who didn't pick up an agenda, there are some summary. Uh, sheets of the budget that are available up where the agendas are. So there's some copies up there if you want to follow along for part of it. It's the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> For those of you who took copies, this you'll be able to follow until we get through the end of the first tab because this the, the materials we reproduced for the public tonight is basically the entire first tab. 
The first thing that I'd like to draw your attention to in the budget, uh, I mean, pardon me, before I get started, I just want to explain to the public what I'll be doing now is walking the school committee through the budget book, which includes the recommendations that were presented at last month. At that time, I said it was not a to the penny budget. This is a to the penny budget and provides more details so that we can have a more fully um, fleshed out discussion at the March 22nd meeting. So calling your attention to the superintendent's budget message, it is different from any other budget message I've written. Um, I would encourage people to take a look at it. The first sentence is, as I prepare the FY19 budget, I ask myself, can a budget be an instrument of healing? Um, you don't see that in a lot of budget documents. It's what I'm really hoping this budget can be. Um, it's no secret that it has been a difficult journey for us all at Bridge Street in particular, in the first grade in particular. Uh, a journey that I truly wish had gone so many different ways. Um, there were very difficult first grade meetings that many of you are a part of. There were difficult school committee meetings. There were difficult PAC meetings. That was a hard process, and I'm really sorry for that. On the other hand, I want to say I know the first grade parents at Bridge Street like no other group of parents since I started working in central office. You know, I, have, I have real relationships there now, and I appreciate that, even though sometimes the relationships are, can you, you know, represent the same data three different ways, which is kind of, I don't love that, but um, it's nice to have parents who send you direct messages on Twitter, nice to have parents that you can pull into their driveway and observe the, the bus stop protests. Um, so it's, I just wanted to acknowledge that, and I wanted to call everyone's attention to that. So that's the first piece that is included in the handouts tonight. Next we'll be turning to the first tab. <coughs> The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the proposed FY19 cost center budget. In this, in this, this matches up with the slide that was shown during the first view budget showing the changes to the school committee appropriation in each of the different cost centers. I should point out that this represents the general education costs in the buildings, the special ed teachers, ESP, and um, other special ed staff are actually contained in the special ed cost center. We are working on another way of representing that because um, it's more consistent with, with the new budgeting guidelines from the state, but this is the way we've always done it in the past, so I think it provides a clearer year-to-year -year comparison. Um, I'll be talking about the new way of budgeting. We did sort of signal what, what that will look like in the future in the budget, and that's in a, a cup coming up in a couple of pages. So the next is a pie chart, which just represents that same data in a different way. This allows you to compare the different cost centers within the district. Uh, I should point out that athletics is 2%. It's actually 1.51% or something like that, so it rounds up to two. Um, it looked like there was a $12,000 change, I think, from last year's budget to this year's budget, and I was wondering, well, how could that be a whole percent? It was because it was right on the borderline. Last year, I think, it was 1.48, and this year it's 1.51 or something like that. So that's difference is kind of um, exaggerated by rounding. The next table, or the next pie chart rather, and table, shows what I think the budget will look like in the future. This shows the cost centers with special education costs included in the building where the staff are, are housed. So in this, in this case, the special education budget is only maintaining um, salaries that are connected to the special education program out of district tuitions, district contracts for special education services, and all the special ed teachers are reported to the schools that they're housed in. The next pie chart shows the local appropriation only. Um, I just wanted to point that out because in this chart, you'll see that 
employee benefits and fixed costs are listed as 0.5 percent. That's because the majority of employee benefits and fixed costs are not included in the appropriation budget. They're included in the indirect costs that were discussed at the last budget meeting. This next pie chart shows the major budget areas in the district. As in prior years, you can see that almost all of the budget goes to personnel. The rest of the costs are, are minor slivers of the pie. The next table shows a summary of all funds. So for the public, our, our budget relies not only on uh, local appropriation, but also school choice, circuit breaker, food service, revolving account, those are the lunch, um, lunch receipts. The athletic revolving account, the bus revolving account, those are bus passes and grants and other, other revolving accounts. The um, circuit breaker number included in this year's budget includes the adjustment from the audit, which we'll be discussing later tonight. So that figure has already been adjusted. The next page shows FTE changes in the budget. I would just draw your attention to the bottom line, which shows that FTEs across the district will be up 5.22 as compared to the current year. There are a lot of positions that are coming into the budget in our proposal. Those are offset by a number of uh, positions that were in last year's budget. Probably the biggest group of those were the temporary ESPs who were included in the budget as sort of our on hand stockpile of ESPs to go to um, to address attrition. As you know, those were all used in the beginning of the year. We're already assigned to their permanent assignments, so those positions are no longer in the budget. The next page is the first item that's new for FY19. It shows ESPs and their location in the budget. It also shows how we have designated regular ed versus special education ESPs. As I mentioned when I um, was discussing the radar data, that's somewhat of an arbitrary distinction. There's no regulation or no rule or no certification that differentiates between regular ed and special ed. Um, this is how we've chosen to do it. So the next tab is just the first view budget. We've already had three hours on that, so I'll skip over. And tab three is Bridge Street. We've added a new feature in all of all of the tabs that involve that have personnel associated with them. If you look beyond the school profile to the third page, you'll see that the current and proposed budget have changes from the prior <coughs> year's budget in staffing explained in the bottom, the bottom of the column. Um, so in this proposed budget, it's an additional point for ESL teacher, additional ESL ESP, and a teacher move from SPED. Again, because special ed is its own cost center in this budget, that shows up as a, as a cost in, um, increase for Bridge Street. So we've done that with all of the different cost centers. I just wanted to point that out as an example since it's the first one in the budget. The next page is something that Candy needs to be com commended for, I believe. As she has been telling us since she's been here, the standard best practice is to show your three prior years actual budget, your current year approved, and your next year's proposed. We were never able to construct from prior budget documents what the actual history was prior to Candy's um, arrival. But now she's been through enough budgets that we have all five years. Yeah, stay there. <laughs> so this was a very important goal for her. Now you can go. <laughs> Free to go now. <laughs> so moving on to tab four, Jackson Street. Um, Again, I just want to point out, since we're still doing this under the old system, 
and a special ed ESP is added, although you don't see it in this, in the um, new section at the bottom on personnel, because the ES, all the special education costs are still in the special ed center, um, just to match up from prior years. So we put that new table in there, basically just to show you where I think this needs to go under new reporting requirements. But in order to keep things consistent for this budget, we we listed those costs where we have traditionally done them in the special ed cost center. Tab five is leads. <coughs> this includes staff for the additional kindergarten that we think we will need at Leeds next year. Um, I just want to point out that as always, the one of the main pieces of our budget that remains to be uncertain well past the time the budget is passed is is all of our kindergartens. How many we'll need, where we'll need them, that may have to adjust. I'm not, I don't have any special um, information that it will have to adjust, but I'm just pointing it out that um, we're about halfway through kindergarten registration now, so that could change in the future. So there's nothing remarkable about Ryan Road there's a lot. <laughs> in the budget book. <laughs> in the budget book. At, and JFK also um, just has features that have already been explained with respect to other tabs. So I'm not going to say anything about that. At the high school, tab eight, you'll see that um, two positions formerly in the special ed cost center are now in the general education cost center. Remember we did some transfers earlier in the year to move an English special education position to a regular ed math position. Um, we also made another change. So this is one of the reasons why the high school um, is the highest increased cost center. A lot of that has to do with moving positions from the special ed cost center into the high school cost center. Um, also, the tech integrator was added this year after the budget was passed, so that also inflates the um, increase at the high school. You remember we paid for that with E-rate money. We did not have the E-rate money at the time the budget was passed, and so that became an additional addition to the budget after the passage when E-rate came in. <coughs> Next is a tab that Candy is going to present. The athletic budget. Um, if we go beyond the profile and actually beyond the uh, normal budget page, there's a lot more detail in the athletic budget. Even though it is that one and a half to two percent of the budget, it's generally an area that brings up a lot of questions, so we provide a lot of detail. So there's a page in here um, at the heading FY19 athletic budget. So it shows you all the anticipated revenue, which includes not only the money that the school community appropriates in its budget, which in, right now is 313000 but also where all the income comes from. A couple of notes on that. The gate receipts, uh, back up to the user fees. Um, Kara has increased the percentage that she's worked into her calculations for free and reduced waivers for students because we're seeing some higher numbers. So in the past, she's used an average of 16%, and she's increased that up to 18% because we're seeing more waivers being given out. The gate receipts is an estimate, the best she can do with the new system that's going in with the season passes and the different changes that we're talking about earlier this year that right now she's doing on a pilot basis. Um, the sign advertising revenue is actually new to the budget revenue projections with the change policies this year. We're beginning to see some sign revenue come in on our joint venture with the NABC. And then lastly, under the revenue, just to recognize the donation of $35,000 that Cooley Dick makes. It's not actually a cash donation to us. They paid directly for the trainer, but we put it in here to acknowledge that because if their donation should go away, we would have to make a decision about whether we maintain a trainer or not from our budget and to give Cooley Dick some recognition for that very substantial donation they make. Um, in the expenses, there's a few notes here. You'll see, um, again, in line with the first view presentation, there were six new Assistant coaches budgeted in the revolving account. That's, um, I don't know if worst case scenario is the appropriate word, but that is only going to be used if the numbers in those sports actually warrant having that additional coach for safety reasons. Um, the faculty managers, site managers are also new. That was in the first few budget, one per season to manage some of the sites when the athletic director is at another site. 
And then there's an hour a day clerical so support put in here to help her with maintaining um, the fees that come in and also the academic attendance and performance of the athletes. The pages behind that actually give you the detail to back up to this. So you've got a page that shows you the revenue by each sport for both user fees and gate receipts. Behind that are two pages listing all the coaches, and you've got some highlighting where the, the indicating the sports where the new assistant coaches would come in if needed. Behind that, you've got the cost by sport by each of the categories on that first budget document. And the last page, page is the one that kind of brings it together. It shows you what the net cost per sport is. This is typically a piece that would come into discussion if we were talking about whether you needed to cut any sports, for example. Because you, you can't just look at the cost of the sport, you've got to look at the revenue they bring in and what the net impact on the budget is. So this shows you what the net cost to us for each of our sports teams is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, do you know if the, um, the co-op, the fees that we're like, for instance, football, if that money that we're getting in is reflected in the net yes. cost? Yes, yep. Um, the notes, there's probably notes off to the side that didn't show here. For both skiing, we get money in for skiing and for the co-op teams. The next page in is a new page. In the past, we've had some smaller donations from NABC that we had kind of worked into the summary page, but they're not really a part of our basic budget. NABC makes donations to help us supplement the program, so we thought it was, oh, it was more reflective of the situation to put it on its own page. So you'll see here that NABC, as of right now, has indicated they anticipate being able to donate $21,400, which is approximately $10,000 more than they had committed to donate this year. So we're very lucky that they've been able to bring in the revenues they have, especially as a result of combining all the different team booster clubs into the NABC. Um, and the money they donate is anticipated to be used for uniform replacements, as outlined here, and then also for some facility upgrades, probably dealing with scoreboards, either the main scoreboard or some supplemental scoreboards out back. They're still working on exactly what they want to do with the scoreboards. And the last page is just put in here for a reference so that we have everything in one place. Um, a couple of years ago, the user fees were increased, so we've got something here so that if you need to, you can locate what the user fees are. There's no recommended changes to the user fees at this point. Now back to me. Tab 10 is student services. <clears throat> On their personnel page, I imagine you may have some question about what the point two restored vacancies are. We did not discuss that at the first few budget. That, that is a current point two vacancy for a school psychologist. Tab 11 is maintenance and capital planning. I really just say maintenance because it has nothing to do with the capital budget. Um, there's a new sheet on this that I want to draw your attention to, which has been <coughs> something that has been saving our bacon this year and it's been built into the budget projections for next year. If you turn all the way to the end of the section, you'll see a new page on utilities. And you'll see about a $75,000 reduction in the electric utilities. That's based on solar net metering. We, we didn't make any changes in the budget this year, even though we knew that this would be the first year of receiving net metering credits. We didn't know how it was going to work out, so we wanted to make sure there was enough money to keep the lights on. But now that we see how it's functioning, we, we feel confident of reducing that line $75,000. Tab 12 is... Central services, I mean, not central service, central office. Um, anything that's related to the district cost center is in this tab. And there is a new, um, new information in this tab about technology. You, it ends with the information technology and digital literary services um, profile, much like the other cost center profiles. And it also has additional information about our plan for enhancing technology tools for education. The next tab is grants and revolving accounts, which is a, a tab that Candy's office 
has their hands all over, so I'll turn it back over to her to present that. Okay. First page is a list of the grants that we have for this year. Obviously, it's too early to know what we're going to do for next year, so what we typically do is give you the current grants so that you get an idea of the magnitude of what we're dealing with, which this year is about $2 million. The next two pages are new. Somewhere through the budget process, it was suggested that we give a brief summary of what each grant is, since they're just numbers that people hear. So some of the smaller grants aren't here, but all the major grants that you tend to see from year to year, there's a brief description of what each of those grants does. Behind that is a list of our revolving accounts, and what we do here is give you last year's activity so you can see the magnitude of the money that comes in and goes out of these each of those accounts and where the balance stood at the end of last year. Um, to my dismay, since we do the bookkeeping on it, the number of revolving accounts is growing. We've actually had to go to two pages. So to some people, that's good. So I guess I'll accept that it's good, even though it's a lot of bookkeeping. A lot of this is the gifts that we deal with at meeting after meeting, gifts coming in from all the various groups. Following that is the budget for school choice. This was one that was touched on briefly in terms of the first view and in terms of the fact that we will be dipping into our stabilization fund, I think is what we've called it. So if you look over to the FY19 budget, you'll see that the budget recommendation is $2,073,000. A year ago when we were doing our five-year stability plan, we were expected to use $1,907,000. So we're actually dipping into that by to the tune of $166,000, which has been part of our long-term plan to have to do that. The other thing you'll notice on here is in the FY18 budget, we had budgeted for the 16 ESP positions that were just mentioned in case we had not had positions to move them into. We had guaranteed those 14 people that they would have a job with us until something else opened. And then the $100,000 for unemployment, we had had to deal with that because of the, the conversion to the WINS model. Um, most of that money is not needed this year. We've made some budget transfers earlier to move that money to some of our other needs, and we don't need to replicate those costs next year. Those were one-time costs. Next page is our circuitry budget. And as was mentioned earlier tonight, the FY19 budget does include the adjustment for the audit that we'll actually be discussing later in the meeting, but we've talked about it prior meetings also. Next page, part of what we do on the revolving accounts is try to give you some historical information so that as you're making plans on what to do, you have an idea of, of the magnitude we've dealt with in the past. So the next page is actually the history of our circuit breaker revenues into the district. The next page is some history on the Bush revolving account. Um, this is critical for two reasons. Number one, if you, if you glance down to the FY18 and FY19 numbers, this page for a substantial portion of our bus contract, just under $100,000 of our bus contract is charged to this account each year from the fees that are paid by students to ride the bus. And the other piece is that our five-year capital plan includes us picking up approximately half of the cost of a new bus whenever one is needed. And from FY20 to FY22, we're scheduled to hopefully um, replace three of our vehicles, and to do that, our portion we're estimating right now would be about $165,000 over those three years that we would need for busing. So the idea is to build up a balance, and then when we pay for the bus, it drops the balance back down. The next page I put in here new, it's basically an inventory of the buses, just so you do have that going forward to see the age of the five buses we have. We operate three buses, and two of them are spares. The next page, just to keep everything in one location, is just that summary again of the athletic revolving account. And behind it is a new sheet, putting historical information together for you again to give you an idea of what the ending balance has been on the revolving account. And you'll notice that over the last three or four years, it's increased substantially. Um, this is due to two things. Number one, the school committee put more money into the athletic program, so we didn't have to draw down quite as much on the athletic revolving. And our athletic director, Kara Dupree, has done a good job of managing her budget with her goal being to increase that balance so that it's there for future improvements to the athletic program. The budget that we propose for this year, if all six assistant coaches are needed and all three facility managers are needed, would actually use about $30,000 of that balance. So the hope is that we don't need all of that. Um, and her hope is also there'll be a balance this year that will increase that up a little bit more. 
but we have had discussions that should she need that whole 30,000 the revolving balance will go down pretty quickly next is some history on the Medicaid revenues um, what's discouraging here and it's going on across the state is the FY 17 revenues for everybody were down um, if you had paid attention to the newspaper last year there was a neighboring school district that on an audit was found to have claimed some costs Medicaid costs for students that were disallowed and as a result of that um, the Medicaid program tightened up on reviewing all accounts we, we don't have any issues but they it slowed down the pipeline as they basically look at things with a sharper magnifying glass so hopefully those revenues will start to go back up but FY 17 was low these monies go into the general fund so that dip in Medicaid actually had an impact on the city more than it had directly on the school department. It affected the city's revenues. The next page is new. This was something I had tried to get to last year with our food service director and we didn't quite make it, so I'm pleased to say that it's here this year. We tried to put together an actual budget for the food service program, both the revenues coming in and the expenses going out. So you've got some detail here that you haven't seen in the past. Again, we tried to put together some past history. Some of that was hard to capture because we previously had not kept a lot of line items within the food service budget, but we've been increasing that both for this purpose and for our reporting to Department of Ed because they're asking for a lot more detail on the food service programs. And you'll see this program runs about three quarters of a million dollars a year. The next page is to give you a historical perspective on the balance in the food service revolving. It does look like we have a decent balance at 122000 If we had not been putting the subsidy in that the school committee has been putting in for years and years, this would actually be running in a deficit every year, which I've tried to show you off to the side. Um, Department of Ed does recommend that we have up to a three-month cash flow. We're, we're not at that. We're just under a two-month cash flow, which is fine. They, if you have more than three months, they want it to go back into the program. Our hope is that we can maintain this balance for another year, and if we do, then we would start to put that into some of the equipment. Uh, we're working on an inventory right now of the major equipment items, the stoves, the walk-in freezers, the fridges, the things that run from three to $10,000 that are gonna need to be replaced. We don't wanna get to a situation, we actually had two freezers die this year. Um, one was able to be replaced through a capital project we have going on at Ryan Rhodes. We didn't have to come up with the funds for that. And another school had a walk-in freezer died, and it was about a $5,000 repair to get that freezer back up and running. Um, we don't want that stuff to happen on an emergency basis and affect our offerings for lunches or even worse. Um, some of the freezers, in particular at the high school, can store up to $30,000 in commodity foods at one time. And if those went down and we lost that, we'd have a major loss to the program. So we want to try and get ahead of this by beginning to replace some of this equipment, hopefully using these funds so that we don't have to go to the city and ask for capital funds. The next page, it's a little complicated to follow. I'm gonna to try to, to run through it quickly here. I tried to come up with a way to look at this that was easy to understand. There's a lot of federal guidelines around how much you have to charge kids for lunch. You actually can't have a price lower than what the federal government pays us for the free lunch students. They don't want their money for, for students for free lunch to be subsidizing the lunch program. So they have what they call pricing equity to make sure that what we're charging kids for lunch is the same as what they're paying for lunch or we put the difference in. They don't want their federal dollars subsidizing the paid lunches. So they set an amount each year. So for this year it's $2.86. And they say that's how much you have to charge to the students who are paying for their lunch or you have to put in the difference. We charge $2.75. This year we budgeted $40,000 towards personnel, which has been going on for, since before I got here for a number of years. Um, and we've got $4,100 in for professional development because of the new federal mandates for the hours of PD that all food service staff must have. Um, last year they served about 80,000 lunches, so when you divide the school committee's appropriation by 80,000, that is worth another 55 cents per lunch. So when you add that to what the kids are paying, we're actually between your contribution and the kids are putting in $3.30 a lunch. So we are okay in terms of the equity. What I tried to show down below that is to say that you would have to put in at least $8,800 to maintain the to meet that equity goal if we're only charging to 75. So we don't need to put in as much as we are from an equity issue. The prior page shows if we weren't putting that much money in the program, we'd be operating in a deficit. So it's kind of balancing those two together. 
The Department of Ed has set, the Federal Department of Ed has set that threshold for next year at $3.92. So we right now don't see that we need to increase our lunch price. The plan right now is to keep it at $2.75. We've actually, in your budget, increased the contribution for personnel costs by $8,000 because the extended lunch periods at the middle school and several of the elementary schools is costing us about $16,000 more in payroll. So our plan was to have the school committee cover 8,000 of that and the food service program cover 8,000. They're actually covering the entire $16,000 this year. So when we look at how much is in the school budget for next year divided by, we're still using the same 80,000 because we don't have this year's numbers of meals yet. That is worth about 65 cents a lunch. So it brings us up to 340. So it does show that we are okay on the equity issue. Um, and again, you would need to put in a minimum of 13.6 if you were to decide to reduce down the, the support for the program. The hope in doing this was to have a tool that can be used going forward too so that we can easily check each year whether we're complying with the equity issue. And the last page is in here again. I think you've seen it before. It's just to keep the history on how much we've contributed for the unpaid student debt, putting it all in the same place in the budget. Tab 14 is Jesse and Department of Revenue information. Approximately five pages in, you'll come to this bar and line. Jeff, what's important to note here, you're on the right one. What's important to note here is the gray dotted line and the blue solid line. The gray dotted line is the required net school spending amount that the city needs to meet in order to satisfy its state obligations for education. The blue line is the amount that's actually being spent. And you can see there's a significant positive gap there. I say cherish the gap. I say it every year. I say it because I've bit worked in districts where the minimum is the maximum. I've worked in a district where the big political speaking point year after year from the city council was, we give an extra million dollars above the required net school spending. What they never said was that's on top of a hundred million dollar school budget, so it's a 1% increase. Um, so that I think is significant, I think needs to be pointed out. The next page is some new chapter 70 charts. It actually introduces a few pages of new chapter 70 charts that were not available in prior years. These show various components of the foundation formula and they allow you to pick comparable districts. So in this we picked the same comparable districts that were used in our DART analysis. So you can see in terms of all the different pieces that go into the foundation formula how we compare to our similar districts. So there are two pages of those. And then the next page that has two sets of bar graphs I just want to point out it, it is said oftentimes that Northampton is a minimum aid community. This shows what that means. Um, if you look at the, the green set of columns you see there's a target aid and required this is the, the percentage of the budget that the state is um, targeting Northampton to be able to pay based on its community wealth. So it's, the state formula says that Northampton should pay 82.9% of the costs of education and that right now they're paying 82.5. So it's virtually at the target which means that any increase is just going to making the, the difference between that 0.4% and it also means that um, it's very hard for Northampton to net anything from the Chapter 70 program at this point. You have to put a lot of money into the Chapter 70 program in order for the local aid to go up. <coughs> That's based on local wealth. I've been in districts where it's the exact opposite where you have 80% being subsidized by the state and 20% being paid locally, then um, the Chapter 70 formula becomes a lot more important and, and student count becomes a lot more important because there are many more dollars, state dollars attached to each student. And so then we'll go to tab 15. 
This is miscellaneous information. And four pages in, there is a table on choice and charter information. I just wanted to point one thing out because I believe it was for the first few budget or it may have been the mayor's city kickoff to the budget season um, <coughs> discussion. There were questions raised about the cherry sheet numbers and how accurate they are. But we can show you an example of the last year. So you have FY18 <coughs> cherry sheet, that's three lines up from the bottom and then what the FY18 actual was. If you go all the way over to the column next to the line, you can see the um, city assessment was overestimated by about $100,000. And then the same thing happens on the choice tuition. You can see the choice tuition was overestimated by about $150,000. This also is a good example of showing you the impact of what's known as the special ed increment within the charter, um, the, the choice program because there was a difference that year of six students in choice but a difference of hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's because some of the students who were exiting were students who were uh, students with disabilities who incurred a high cost for which an increment was awarded on top of the five thousand dollar choice amount so it's not only your total number of students in choice but it's the number of students who are triggering the special education increment that end up um, generating your choice revenue at the end of the year and so the the cherry sheet projection can be quite a bit off because it doesn't know what the needs of your students are going to be it only knows if students are choiced in or not the next page shows that same information in a different way and you can see the same increment um, the special ed increment impact between 2016 and 2017 there there was a difference we actually took in three more students through the choice program but netted about two hundred thousand dollars less again it's because the students who were coming in were less expensive than the students who were leaving the next um, part I want to draw your attention to is quite a bit in. If you can find the section that says per pupil expenditure information, it's ahead about 12 pages. with me long enough to know that I don't really like the horse race aspect of education but there are two charts in here that I, I think are important you see the the comparison of FY17 per pupil expenditures as compared to 20 nearby districts and then right behind that you have the FY16 per pupil expenditures as compared to the same districts you can see that we jumped up quite a bit from 2016 to 2017. We went from 14 out of 20 to 10 out of 20 in a race that I think is good to win, which is um, increasing per pupil expenditures. And then the very last thing that I'll point out is three more pages in. In addition to the glossary of grants. We also put a glossary of frequently used abbreviations throughout the budget process, which also would be a very helpful um, reference for many other discussions on education. So I just want to conclude by thanking Candy and her staff for all her work on this. There are so many parts of this budget that have been a dream of hers to be able to portray ever since she's been here. This is it's hard for me to say, but it is her last budget book, and I think it is her best one ever. So thank you very much. Okay. So. Um, 
I should say this will be placed on the website so the public can take a closer look at it too. Exactly. So this is the presentation of the budget book. Um, are there any questions specifically about what? Um, yes. I mean, I have to say, I mean, of course, I have questions um, which I might save so that I can <coughs> dig in. But actually, one of the things that I really love about the budget that is created in Northampton. Um, is particularly the descriptions that the schools give of their individual school, and it's not a template. And I really hope that people recognize, like it makes it sometimes a little more challenging to read and compare, but it's so breathtaking to let, and that we have a community that lets each school represent themselves through their school councils in their own way. And I really, it's one of my favorite parts is reading um, the descriptions of the schools. So. I really applaud that flexibility. <laughs> okay. Other questions or comments for tonight? Again, we'll be coming back to dig in on this at our next meeting once we have a chance. And you've been fielding some questions already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so keep the questions coming. Um, okay. So we'll now move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, this is a vote on the 2018-2019 district calendar. Um, Dr. Provost, do you want to say anything about this? Just a few things. Um, the calendar is in your packet. I wanted to just point out that there is much more information in this calendar than I'm actually requesting a vote on tonight. Um, the committee has to set the start date and the end date which obviously are reflected, but this is also a communication um, tool for the community. So um, the rest of the items are just there for informational purposes only. So just clarifying the vote I'm requesting. And uh, I just wanted to point out that this calendar has been reviewed by NACE and found to be free from um, contractual errors. Uh, there was one modification made to the calendar based on feedback from NACE, it was minor. Um, they had pointed out that it would be more convenient for teachers to move one of the spring report card dates and so we did do that. Okay, any questions about the calendar? Um, so uh, do you, I guess I'll entertain a motion to approve the, the, just the calendar for 2018-2019. Move to approve the 2018-2019 district calendar. Second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Voss. Any discussion, questions? Ms. Um, Allen. I just hope that, I know we do advertise it, but um, I hope that we remind parents that school is starting in August because I think it surprised some people despite us sending the calendar out. Um, and I know some people were planning their family vacation soon for the summer, so okay. I hope we, we remind everyone, because I know some people have asked me, I don't know, we haven't approved it yet, but now that w once it is approved, I hope we really make that clear. Yeah. And it'll go on the website, mm -hmm. presumably, so, and will copies go home at schools, probably, I would assume, this later this spring? So. We make, yes, we make okay. hundreds of copies. Ms. Busansky. And is that our, that is our plan moving forward, right? To continue to start school before Labor Day, is that right? I mean, I think parents moving forward should just recognize that this is. Well, this was specifically negotiated in the last contract, <laughs> so I, I think um, it would be almost bad faith not to start before Labor Day. Right. It was something that both sides wanted to have the flexibility to do because they felt it was a good thing. Right, so just so parents yes. understand that that's you know a shift that's going to continue it's not sort of an annual vote issue as much as okay so there's been a motion made and seconded to approve the calendar any other questions or discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye, aye. opposed any abstentions okay so the calendar is approved the next is a vote uh, for a job description for a mathematics instructional coach dr. provost thank you as I mentioned in my email to committee members, this is, um, I'm requesting approval for this now. Of course, staffing the position would be contingent on passing the budget. Uh, the uh, proposed budget does include a math coach position. That's a position that does not currently exist within the district. <coughs> in order to um, prepare for that, we've prepared this job description, which we'd ask you to approve. It's highly similar to the, the ELA instructional coach we have now, except with the 
references that are specific to English language arts being replaced with references that are appropriate for mathematics. Okay. Any any questions? Oh, yes, Mr. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Provost, wouldn't it be timely at this point to add um, uh, either under preferred competencies or maybe a new section, preferred qualifications that the individual has background, understanding, knowledge of uh, teaching or uh, you know, supporting mathematics in an inclusive environment? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Should I? move to do that I need a if, if you want why don't you move the move the job description mm -hmm. um, and then with that amendment if you'd like do you want to just move it move approval of it with that amendment sure I move to um, approve the job description for the mathematics coach with the additional language in either the existing Preferred competencies or a new section called preferred qualifications that the individual has some understanding, background, and experience with, te with teaching mathematics in an inclusive environment. Okay. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded to approve the uh, job description with that, uh, with that edit. Any discussion? I, I love that. I think I would have it under qualifications, though, because it seems essential for what you're doing and what we're doing in our district. But that's just minimal, but I love it. Do you have a comment? Or? I'm fine with putting it in either section. Okay. Do you, are you okay leaving it? Your motion kind of has the discretion, but if you want to. Um, um, I guess I would just ask Dr. Provost, do you think it would be harder to attract a math coach if we make that into a qualification? Is that type of individual so hard to recruit that you'd be at all concerned with making it a requirement as opposed to a preferred requirement? I would not. Okay, then I would agree with my colleague from Tennessee and change it to uh, placement of that language in qualification. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And you had said either or, correct? Or I was unclear when you made the motion, so. It did, so okay. I would say now. So you're the maker of the motion's gonna pull it back to just qualifications? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, does the seconder still support that? Yes, okay. the seconder does. Okay. <laughs> any, other, um, any other comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor of approving the uh, description as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so that's approved. Um, next, there is a vote to create a 0.5 preschool teacher position. For the public, I will just explain that preschool is different than <coughs> any of the other grades we have in that there's no cutoff date. Students with disabilities who require a preschool program become eligible to receive services whenever they turn three. So it's rolling admissions throughout the year. Also, um, Preschool is the only grade that by regulation has to be inclusive. So we need to provide typical peers also on a rolling basis to match up with students with disabilities who are turning three. Um, we have four classes, four teachers, that's eight classes because classes are half day sessions right now, and they're full. Um, the regulation also caps the size of the preschool class at 15 so we can't add um, add students to those classes. So uh, really the only option left for our students who we already know will be needing services in the next few weeks is to open an additional class. Um, when I had first um, discussed this at agenda setting, I thought we would only need an additional <coughs> teacher because we'd be starting with a small number of students. However, um, as Mr. Dixon's memo points out, we actually will need an ESP for that class also um, in part to deal with bathroom issues, and also in part because the class is already bigger than we thought it would be when I first um, discussed it. Um, so this uh, is not technically a transfer. We have money in the preschool revolving account. That account is um, the, the place where we, we keep the money that is paid for typical peers for their tuitions, and so we'd like to use that tuition money to pay for those positions. 
oh, I should say this. Um, the, the additional preschool would be at, preschool classroom would be at Bridge Street. This has been discussed with the staff and administration at Bridge Street, and they have a location pointed out, uh, picked out. Okay. So, could I get a motion on this for discussion? A motion to create a .5 preschool teacher position. Yes. Is there a second? Okay, seconded. Any questions or comments to follow up, Ms. Fallon? Um, Mr. Dixon had mentioned in the letter about the accreditation that would be necessary to have it at one of the other schools. Are, is that part of the plan to begin that process? I don't know anything about it. Well, Mr. Dixon is here, so he could answer why he said that, but I can talk about the accreditation piece. When we were first looking at the need to open another um, preschool, we thought about potentially putting it at one of the other schools, uh, but then we quickly realized we haven't accredited any of the other schools to have a preschool. Um, we talked about this a little bit when we created the second preschool at Leeds. Um, they did have to go through uh, a kind of expedited or, or maybe you could even say relaxed um, accreditation because essentially they're functioning in part under the accreditation that was already established at Bridge Street. You can have up to two additional sites going through that same sort of streamlined um, accreditation process, but there's no way you could get an accreditation process done as quickly as we need to open the class. So it has to go either at Leeds or at Bridge, and there's more space available at Bridge right now. Does that answer your? It does. Um, but I, the question I wanted was, that, was, is there a future plan to accredit one of the other elementary schools for further expansion of the preschool? I can't say a future plan. I can say a lot of future discussion. Um, I, I'm just thinking of this now. It might, it might make sense to try to see if we could get an accreditation for the possibility, um, even if we don't start the year with a preschool, because this is something that happens to us quite frequently in the spring. Um, I have two things. One, was I supposed to add ESP? to my motion, so we'll have to make a separate motion for the ESP. Yeah. Because it's not really on the agenda. It's not on the agenda, but you discussed it. Is that oh. separate, John? Oh, this is the, the teacher. This is just for the teacher? So there, I said there's two ways to address it, and I would say it would be the pleasure of the chair. Okay. Um, if, if it's close enough, and in the mayor's judgment to the original motion to add, to amend it to include the ESP, that could be done. Okay. Or we could add it to the agenda for the meeting on the 22nd. Um, in reality, we're still gonna be in the process of setting up at that time, so we could just add the ESP to that agenda. Yes, so the, I think the question is that there was a, uh, an agenda item set up to create this new preschool position and it was only a 0.5 teacher, but you also needed a full-time e a 0.5 ESP as well to go along with it. <coughs> that was not part of it. Yeah. So the question is, could that could you amend that agenda item to include that? Uh, you know, could you to include that 0.5? So, uh, I mean, the public was noticed that we were going to be talking about adding a preschool preschool position. So I think it would be it could go either way. I think it's. I think it's fine to add the 0.5 if you want to amend to say okay. you'd like to add this additional position. Yes, I would like to amend the motion to add the 0.5 ESP to the preschool. To the 0.5 preschool. To the 0.5 okay. preschool teacher position. Okay. Is there a, okay. Um, all those in favor of making that amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now the motion, the, the, the motion's been amended to say creating a 0.5 preschool teacher as well as a 0.5 ESP position uh, for uh, preschool. Can I just ask one yes, question? Um, how long does the accreditation last for? Do you know, John? I don't know. I was just curious because Jackson Street School used to have the preschool, so they would have had accreditation, and I'm curious, I mean, under our current accreditation, yeah. um, we have accreditation for Bridge Street and Leeds until 2021. Okay. Um, and then we would have to go through the process again. The Department of Early Childhood and Care is changing sort of their routines in terms of the accreditations that they're recognizing <coughs> for our grants. Um, and so that's something that we're keeping an eye on. So by the time we're up for reaccreditation, we would 
go through their new process, okay. essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly something that I'm happy to investigate in terms of adding accreditation or pursuing accreditation with the possibility of expansion um, for the other two elementary schools as we move forward. Can I ask one more question? Sure, Ken. Mr. Sorry. Um, is there any concern about this inflating the number or bringing more students into the Bridge Street program by increasing the preschool program there, or will they then enroll in their home district for kindergarten? They would be eligible to, to enroll in their home district for kindergarten. Okay. Well, will they be eligible to go to Bridge Street if they're... If they're a Bridge Street student... No, no, I get Bridge that, but it's not going to make it so that all these other no. okay great I didn't think so <laughs> I'm just like whoa, whoa, whoa you understood my question okay I do because it was a big problem for years because it wasn't clear to parents and I think that we took care of that and made it very clear that when you go to a preschool it's a you know it's part of a district program and then you'll go to your mm -hmm. home school it used to be very uh, confusing <coughs> for parents and they felt very attached to the school sure. yeah Can I just ask one related sure. question so at the four elementary schools, if there was accreditation at all four, I understand there is not. Is there space at those other schools right now for a preschool? What does the space look like across all four? I think Ryan Road has capacity for a preschool. Um, Jackson Street is tight right now. Sure. Real quickly, I'm, I'm so impressed with the fact that we have two, e two ESPs that are certified to teach, and I'm pretty sure in the past we had some ESPs that got promoted or um, moved into a teaching position. So it says something, I think, about the quality of the ESPs that we attract into that program and the overall quality of the program, that we would have so many ESPs that are certified. So congratulations on whoever's doing the marketing and recruitment for that. So there's, um, we're, we're back to the, the main motion as amended. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, that <coughs> is passed as amended. Um, the next item on the agenda is a second reading and vote. Uh, this is the um, co-curricular and extracurricular activities policy JJ revised. Ms. Fallon, did you want to say anything more about that? Um, I think we covered everything last month, so it was just um, to vote on amending policy JJ to include a number six, which would read students not enrolled in Northampton public schools are ineligible to participate in co-curricular and extracurricular activities, with the exception of homeschooled students participating in athletics as per policy IHBGB. Okay, could you make the motion? Um, so I would move to amend policy JJ. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to amend policy JJ. Is there any um, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is uh, amended. Um, next, we will have the fifth reading on the naming of the Leeds Elementary Baseball Diamond in honor of Jim Myas. Um, Mr. Meyer is not here. <coughs> says something so we'll uh, just note that he is a strong supporter of this uh, naming of the Leeds Elementary Baseball Diamond uh, then we have a fifth reading the naming of the Leeds Elementary Playground Pavilion in honor of uh, Julie Clark again uh, Mr. Myers a strong proponent of this um, so this will be the fifth reading it'll come back for a sixth reading and vote at our next meeting um, Next, we have a vote to authorize the superintendent to draft a memorandum of agreement on elementary club advisor stipend. Dr. Provost, do you want to speak to this? The unit aid contract includes a stipend for new clubs at the middle and high school. This was a, um, I'm going to speak from my perspective as an observer because I was not a negotiator um, at, at the sessions. But I don't believe that there was any discussion or intent to specifically exclude elementary teachers from the possibility of earning a stipend for creating a club. The reason that I think the language read that way is carrying over from prior year CBAs, where all of the clubs were at middle and high school, um, that that language was just carried forward. And it was fine for 
for the first year and a half, almost two years of this contract, because there still were no elementary clubs. Well, now we have a teacher at Ryan Road who has a student leadership club, and we don't have a way to pay her. Um, so I have discussed this with the teacher chapter coordinator. Um, she is in agreement that the, the CBA wasn't intended to exclude elementary teachers from the possibility of becoming club advisors and thinks that um, she would be able to get a MOU signed by the president. So um, what I'm requesting here is I think it's in this line with the spirit of the negotiations for you to authorize me to work with Layla on preparing that MOU for your signature and for the signature of the association president. Okay. Move to authorize the superintendent to draft an MOA on the elementary club advisor stipend. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay, so you are duly authorized. Uh, next, there's a vote to refer the matter of AP exam questions to subcommittee. And I'll turn this to Dr. Provost. As you will recall from our last meeting at which we had the Student Advisory Council present, um, they had requested the beginning of a discussion on the, the high school's policy of requiring AP testing for students who enroll in AP courses. Since that time, I've been in communication with different um, committee members on this issue, and there have really been two subcommittees that have shown an interest and, and might be a natural place for this to land. One is the curriculum subcommittee because um, this would impact the entire AP program. The other is policy subcommittee because we have learned that there's an opportunity to use Title IV funds to subsidize the cost of testing for students. It wouldn't be enough to fully subsidize the testing for all students at the current level that we're doing it. Um, it is uh, in the range of two to $10,000 that we could qualify for. But in order to <coughs> Uh, access those funds and be able to distribute them to students, we would need to craft a policy on AP test taking. So um, I put that question before the committee to either refer it to one of the two subcommittees or to say, no, we, we can't you know, accept the recommendation of the subcommittee. We need to hash it all out for ourselves or to say, we don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's just move on. Okay. Ms. Fallon. Can I, I, I'm actually struggling with the premise. I'm wondering why we can't, like, I feel like they're two separate issues and it should be referred to both committees. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like the question of whether the AP exam should be required should be required, perhaps referred to curriculum, whereas the question of who is eligible to receive those Title IV funds and that policy should be sent to rules and to, to what are we? Rules and procedures. Rules and procedure. policy. <laughs> Although, you know, <laughs> but it, it's so I'm just I'm just thinking those are two separate issues, and in fact that there's a lot more haste in figuring out the procedure for dispersing disbursement of funds, so that we have that done in time to apply for the Title IV grants, and for students to receive them. Whereas the curriculum issue could be a much bigger, broader discussion, and there wouldn't be a time constraint on that. I mean, that's my way of thinking. I don't know if it's. I don't, I don't see that that is uh, a wrong way of thinking, but I think that the time constraint will come in. Um, if in order to get a policy in place in time to apply in July, the Rules and Policy Subcommittee needs to get something ready, it will mean that it has basically made the decision. Right? It would be hard for the Curriculum Subcommittee then to say something different. But I, but I don't think that they're I mean, whether or not it's required to take the exam, students will, in <coughs> fact, opt to take the exam. And those students who are eligible to apply for funding for that, we should have a mechanism for how that's decided. And so I don't think that they are necessarily related and that you need to make a decision on one to make the decision on the other. Possible, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm thinking about this. Mm -hmm. in, yeah in a different way, but I, it seems to me that you, you don't need to make, mm -hmm. the curriculum just mm -hmm. wouldn't have to make a decision before policy could make a decision. The policy, the policy wouldn't, I'm not clear what the policy has to be, but it doesn't have to be a policy that states whether or not the exams are required if you enroll in the course, I think. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. That's it correct. would just be for those students <coughs> who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, how would it work? Is it that you would get 
you know, half price on the exam? Is it for the first exam free? Is it full price for the first and yeah, then yeah. reduced price for the rest? Like, I think that's the question. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many issues about how is that money dispersed? that have nothing to do with whether the exam is required. Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. I think you should make a motion. And so, so can I move to, move to have this, the question of the AP oh, exam? Oh, we have a person standing up. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, you, you, may have, you may, yes. I just want to add um, one detail that's very important and it is very timely, that we already have a Title IV grant um, we already have the grant for this year, and it's in, but we have no way to disperse the money because we don't have a policy. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I believe that AP testing is coming up, and we'll have to disperse the money very soon. So the policy of, of, is of the essence of time at this point, and then hopefully we'll be able to continue to use the pro, the uh, policy next year, of course. The other issue is that we have about five thousand dollars from our wonderful mayor. Uh, from the, uh, I don't know, it was donated money apparently. Um, and Maybe from some generous donors. <laughs> generous donors. <laughs> Solicited. Oh, yeah. um, and so we have that money to disperse as well, which doesn't necessarily <coughs> need to be dispersed using the same policy, but I would, I would hope that we would use the same policy to disperse that money as well. But the Title IV money um, does have some rules attached to it um, and, and a timeliness attached to it as well. May. Is one of the rules that the test has to be required? Uh, no, that's okay. not right. one of the rules. <laughs> that no. seems like it wouldn't be that no, uh, <laughs> no, it's more about um, no, money know. being dispersed yeah. to those students who truly need it. Right. Yeah. So I was going to make a motion to have the question of policy referred to rules and policy, subcommittee of rules and policy, and the question of whether or not the AP exam question of whether exams should be required for students enrolled in the courses to be referred to the subcommittee on curriculum. Okay. Motion. Second. Seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say oh, aye. Oh, sorry. Discussion. Sorry. Yes. I just wanted to really briefly thank the committee for taking this up. Um, it's something that the student union has worked really hard on over the past year and it is um, really gratifying to see the committee uh, take this up and refer to subcommittee. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the ayes have it, and the matter gets referred to two committees. <laughs> um, <laughs> <see that> coming. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next is a discussion. This is on school safety and uh, response to uh, the latest school shooting um, we got several inquiries from members who wanted to just have an opportunity to talk about um, this issue at our uh, next meeting this meeting and so I'm really just gonna sort of open the floor for discussion I know superintendent provost uh, in, in the preparatory notes you know just indicated that you know we it's, it's important that we talk about this is this issue but obviously we don't <coughs> talk about specific measures that we use in the district in this type of a forum but I guess I'll just open the floor to people who want to ask questions or discuss I know we've heard students are taking their own action on this issue which I'm really proud of and um, so I'll just turn the floor over to folks who have questions who want to discuss yes yeah I do I do just think it's important for the committee to hear this piece I've been part of um, meeting with students and organizing around um, the, the protests and marches that I mentioned in my report, but I think it is valid for school officials to hear um, how these events really do affect student anxiety and how students function and exist in our schools. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard of students being nervous every time the intercom comes on during class or um, just really aware of the space they're in in, in, in light of these events. Um, and I don't think there's an easy fix to that. I don't think it's necessarily something that this committee can flip a switch or vote on a policy and, and fix, but I think that it's important that um, all of the committee members understand how it feels for many students to exist in our schools in these weeks. Yes. Just in response to that as parents, um, I think that you know it's a very anxiety-ridden <laughs> experience for us too. And, 
And it's interesting to consider the history of it also with Newtown and that they were younger aged kids when our kids were in the elementary schools as well. And sort of this experience of aging up um, is really challenging. So, yes. Um, I guess I just want to say from the perspective of administrators, um, I was with a group of most of the superintendents in Hampshire County last Friday, and the common theme was we're all afraid to go to sleep because we're afraid we're going to miss a telephone call or afraid we're going to miss an email or a text or something. Um, so we're feeling that as well in our own way. Any other thoughts, discussion? Yeah. I, I just, this is a horrible that we have to discuss this, but I just think it's incumbent upon us to always think of what are, what are our responsibilities and how can we, I don't, there is no answer, um, but what are the conditions in our schools that we're helping create, whether it, and we hear anxiety a lot and tests and data and, and just how can we make our schools um, not just safer, but a place where there's joy and love and and I know that sounds you know up in the air cloudy and but something's dramatically changed in our schools and, and it's not just because of these school shootings um, and I do think we have to figure out ways there's not one fix and you know Renee Wetstein said something great about the it's not just one thing, but I think we could help create conditions. And maybe it is having a late start eking away. Maybe it is paying for the AP exams. Maybe it is having longer advisory. Maybe it is not always thinking about MCAS and talking about bubble kids and getting our MCAS scores up because little kids are, are stressed in schools um, and funding more for mental health and funding our communities and funding our schools. I mean, this is a multifaceted problem with just with more solutions than we can actually name and but I think all the time when we meet we need to be talking about that somehow so that's me and my soapbox and there, oh, sorry, yes. I, I would like to speak to that point um, from my own experience in a variety of different settings um, and I would say that it has run the full gamut in, in my experience from some schools where kids brought weapons every day with permission yeah. and we took the weapons off of them in the morning and just stored them for them the day and gave them <coughs> to them at the end of the day because that was the only way they would come to school they needed them for protection to and from the building and there was an agreement and that was allowed i've also been in programs where we were searching kids three times a day where every single piece of silverware was counted and we would lock the school down if one of the spoons went missing. Um, and I think that in every, every kind of security standing in between those two extremes. I think that for me, what makes schools safe are the relationships between students and kids. I mean, between students and, and staff. Um, in that most extreme case I just exampled where kids were subjected to three times a day searches they still got guns into into our schools um, and we had situations that was when i was working in dys we had situations where students escaped using weapons but we never had a situation where somebody was murdered using a weapon and every single time it was because there was an adult who was on the list of people who had to be killed who had a relationship with the student and the student said, I don't want to see that person get killed. So in my mind, um, the thing that provides the greatest level of security in schools are staff and kids who care for each other. Um, and I, yeah, I, I feel like that is, and that is so important. And I just want to be sure that we are providing the space for those relationships to grow and the opportunities, because I do see glimpses of it at every level. Like even at uh, open house in the fall, a, a high school teacher said, you know, these kids, they're all shy and they, they don't really know each other. So I said, you know what, let's just go for a walk and we're going to walk and talk until you can trust each other and you get to know each other because that's what's going to make our discussions in class so much more meaningful. 
And I thought, gosh, just taking like a few minutes of one day to go for a walk to get these kids so that they know each other and, and build relationships. That to me seems so valuable and so worth it. And I don't know if that happens in every classroom, but I was so impressed that it happened in that classroom. Um, and I wonder if that's something, that sort of thing, if there's something more we could be doing to support teachers and students and parents to have the time to build those relationships. You know, not, not long, you know, people can commit to five minutes or to a half hour. Like, just make sure we have the space for that meet and greet like used to happen. You know, it happens at a lot of the elementary schools. You pick your kids up and you're waiting at the playground and that's how you meet people. But once you get to the middle school or the high school, like those opportunities kind of dwindle and you're not meeting as many parents. Um, PTO meetings aren't as well attended. So I, I just keep thinking like, what can we do to build that community that might make everyone feel a little safer and everyone a little less anxious? We just wanted to put some space on the agenda since, uh, since recent events to have an opportunity to, to discuss or answer questions that people have. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the report from, um, from Ms. Walczak on the FY17 Extraordinary Relief Audit. Yeah, we've talked about this, I believe, at one or two meetings, and it was referenced earlier tonight. We finally got the actual documentation in from the Department of Ed, so we've given you a copy of the cover letter um, outlining what happened. And again, this was a case of by filing a small amount of claims that were later ruled ineligible, it ended up kicking our whole eligibility out. So it wasn't that we had $156,000 of ineligible cost. We just had enough ineligible cost to mean we didn't to mean we did not meet the qualifications for anything, so therefore the entire amount got taken back. And that's what's been factored into next year's budget. Okay. Uh, next there's a report, this is again from Ms. Walczak, on the student activity account audits. Yes, for those of you that have been on the committee for a while, you've seen this, this audit is actually done by an outside auditor every three years, so some of you have seen audits in the past that have had many more findings. Um, this is an area I'm very proud of working with my staff that we made a lot of progress in cleaning up a lot of things around these accounts to the point where each building only has five findings. You seldom have an audit with no findings, so the fact that we got down to five I think is good. We've outlined um, what brought us to this point. Uh, the staff, including my assistant business manager who gets more credit for this than I actually do, I just kept asking her to work on it. Um, mentioning the staff that got us to this point and then also outlining the findings and what we're going to do about them. The first finding is actually one that will need some discussion either now or at a later point during the budget. The annual review of the accounts. The state regulations require you bring in an outside auditor at least once every three years. That audit this year cost us $4,500. On the two off years you need to have a smaller, I call it a review. Um, it's not as formal as an audit. And we've looked at the options, and at this point, it looks like that's not anything the city's going to be able to do. So we would be looking at whether we want to have a full audit to the tune of 4500 and up to $5,000 a year, or if we want to do something smaller, bringing in a, um, some other group that may be able to come in. The only one that I'm aware of right now is my state professional organization does this with retirees. They come in, and their cost right now is close to $2,000 a year to come in and do that review. So we've got a couple of different options. Whichever route we go will be something that our budget will have to pick up because the accounts do not earn enough interest to cover the cost each year of these reviews. And it's just, they only make a few dollars interest each year. Is that something that collaborative ever covers or takes, yeah. if all schools need to have this outside review? Like, is there? They haven't. I don't know of any collaborators in the state that are doing it. But I'm going to see if there's other options they other should. than NASPO. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if every district needs to do it if there could be kind of some trade. Well, some districts that's being done by you the city. You could do it for some other district. They do it for, not you, but, you know, someone from your office. Do it for another district. You do it for there. There could be some kind of. I think it comes down to carrying swap. the insurance for it, mm -hmm. for that kind of review. Oh. Um, and that's part of the reason the city doesn't want to be doing it, because they don't have the same training. Their staff doesn't have the same training on it. Mm -hmm. um, the requirement to have this done, it's probably five or six years old, and what's happened is most of the school districts have not complied. So the, requi the state requirements now have changed to a written review. 
so that when the auditors come in every three years, they have to ask for a copy of your review from the prior two years. So the state is actually tightening up on it because a lot of districts weren't doing it. So I don't know that we need to decide tonight, but this is something that will have to be decided by the end of the year on which route we want to go. Whether we want to go with a, I don't really want to use the word informal, but a more informal review for less money or go with a full-blown audit by the city's outside auditors, which is a, you know, a little more than double the price of an informal review. Kenny, I'm thinking of a potential business opportunity for you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just start a company. They keep flipping burgers. <laughs> 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 actually, that's actually how Masbo got into it because the uh, Mass Association of School Business Officials, because nobody was doing these other than auditors and their price tags are higher. And what they do is bring on retired business administrators mm. in whatever region they're doing the reviews on. I have not signed up for that. <laughs> Yet. 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 I have not signed that's up. Right. <laughs> Make us an offer. Month two of retirement. <laughs> Can I just clarify one thing? Do, there's two things here. There's the JFK fund and the Northampton High School fund. Yes. Do they get combined into a $2,000 review, or do you need a separate one for each? The price quote I was given covered up to two schools. Okay. So we would be safe there. And, and the 4500 for the full audit was for both schools okay. together. So, I mean, just one way I'm thinking about this is JFK, the total amount is <coughs> $30,000, right? So to pay $2,000 yeah. every year to have $30,000 sounds like a lot, whereas at the high school it's closer to 100,000, 2%, still a lot, but it's, it kind of depends on the total yeah, amount I too. The, the 30,000 is a little deceiving, I think. The 30,000 was a cash balance in all of the sub accounts oh, okay. at the end of the year. But if you think of some of the trips, and I, I don't have a number, okay. some of the trips that go through at the middle school, okay. they probably in the course of the year, I know when I looked at this more closely in my last district, the amount of money that ran through the middle school was almost identical to the high school. Middle schools tend to have those bigger trips. Mm -hmm. Here we do have some trips at the high school too, so um, we'd actually have to sit down and have, have the bookkeepers tally up how much cash runs through the accounts during the year. The audit showed their balances on June 30th. It's clearly an unfunded mandate from yeah. DESE, <laughs> but at the same time, there have been a lot of high-profile yeah. scandals involving, mm -hmm. including most recently Boston mm -hmm. Public Schools, because yes. um, these are accounts that are just prone to this kind of issue. Um, so anyway. I think that's what's probably drivers of the nation. So, mm -hmm. so um, next uh, report is the business administrator's report from Ms. Walzik. Okay, again, you've got the, there's not much here this month, you've got the monthly Munich report that does not look too much different than it has in past mm -hmm. months. We're just continuing to watch the accounts. Um, for gifts, we had four gifts this month that were accepted by the school principals from their PTOs at Leeds School. There was a gift of approximately $110 um, paying a bill on behalf of School Sprouts, the gardening program. At Ryan Road, Bridge Street, and Jackson Street, each of the PTOs donated $150 towards Symbaloo, which is a software package used in the buildings. Personnel report. Regular warrants. And then the personnel report, uh, again, short at this time of year. We had five new hires, three were teachers and two were ESPs. We had a separation of an adjustment counselor, um, retirement of a long-term guidance counselor, and also the retirement of a secretary. Excellent. So now we'll turn to the superintendent's report. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so on the... Um, the letter and the news that we got from Desi regarding the um, hundred fifty-six thousand yeah. dollars. Is there any recourse? Is there any appeal? Is that anything that we can do at this point? No. Um, if you go on to the second page, it does say that they actually added some eligible expenses back in as they were doing the calculations at the yeah. request of the SPED department as they were going through the student by student. But at this point, there's no further appeal process. It was just whatever happened during the actual audit. Dr. Provost. Thank you. The dominant theme in the National Educational Dialogue these past several weeks has been the school tragedy in Parkland and the inspiring student response. The students have even inspired the superintendents of Franklin and Hampshire County to join the conversation 
in a letter that we've all signed and that will appear in the Gazette on March 14th. So I'm glad that you're making it a student only event, but we will be there with you in spirit. You can take the newspaper to prove it. Um, last Friday, I was with my fellow superintendents and much of the Western Massachusetts <coughs> legislative delegation. I shared this thought with them and I'd like to sh offer it for our community too. In my perspective, the public schools have been left sweeping up after a number of youth serving institutions that have been allowed to atrophy. I have seen about enough media coverage labeling kids as troubled. There have been 104 fatal shootings on school grounds since Columbine. Isn't that enough evidence to conclude that it's the whole system that's troubled? Even though the individual perpetrators are accountable, those who've allowed the support systems for young people to fall apart are all responsible. We live in a society that subjects kids to all <coughs> kinds of deprivations and then blames them when they finally go off. And all this has happened on our watch. That's something that I feel deeply sorry for. I started this meeting with an apology and I'll end it with an apology for that. I, if we want to understand what's wrong with kids, I really think it would be helpful for us to start with looking at what's wrong with us. I think it's almost giving ourselves and our leaders a pass to focus solely on the question of what to do with guns. That's what I shared with our, our legislators. Um, don't kill me for saying this, but I said, I don't need the schools to get all the money but I need the child serving institutions of our society to have a priority in state level budgeting. But I don't see that anywhere on the horizon. Um, in fact, we've just passed a huge federal tax cut which will further erode services for young people. And that really concerns me because the one extremely slender shred of hope that we were asked to hang on to at that meeting was the fair share amendment. That's it, it's a plan with no backup. And it's the, the one thing that um, we're looking at right now as a state as keeping us from going into the abyss. So that's a depressing note to end on. Um, but as a wise leader from a nearby city once told me, if you can't think of anything kind or uplifting or sweet to say, then you have to tell the truth. That's my report. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Next um, business, we, next, we don't have any new business. Future business and meeting dates, we have the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, uh, March 14th at 3.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. We have the School Committee meeting of March 22nd, uh, 7.15 p.m. here at JFK Community Room. We have a School Committee meeting with the Student Advisory Committee on April 12th at 6.45 p.m. in the JFK Community Room, and a School Committee meeting on April 12th, 2018 at 7.15 p.m in the JFK community room. Um, I would now entertain a request for an executive session in the JFK principal's conference room. And I move that request for an executive session in JFK principal's conference room under Massachusetts general law open meeting for the approval of executive session minutes June 23rd, 2016, June 29, 2017. Actually, um, we're, we're a little ahead of schedule to uh, meaning uh, two of the folks who are supposed to be in executive session with us have not arrived yet. Um, so I'm actually going to ask for a recess of the regular meeting uh, until we can arrive, until we can determine their whereabouts, and then we'll come back out of recess to do this motion. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, not I a problem. To, <laughs> I just don't want to go into executive session and then we're not prepared for the executive session. How long is our recess? Um, Let's uh, let's do a. Why don't we text some people during the recess? Yes, <laughs> uh, we'll do a ten-minute recess, and then we'll um, reconvene in ten minutes at nine fifteen, according to that clock. Okay, we are coming out of a recess at the Thursday, March eighth, two thousand and eighteen uh, school committee meeting. Um, and we will now proceed to uh, the next item on our agenda, the final item on our agenda, 
uh, and I'll turn to the vice chair to request an executive session. Make a motion to request uh, an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting for the approval of executive session minutes, June 23rd, 2016, June 29th, 2017, August 10th, 2017, August 16th, 2017, October 23rd. 2017 in chapter 30a section 21a2 to hold a grievance hearing whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into an executive session okay so there's a motion made is there a second okay um, I would ask the clerk to call the roll this is a roll call vote uh, yes to go into executive session yes Yes. 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 So I would announce to the public that the school committee will now be moving into an executive session because to hold these uh, discussions in public uh, would be detrimental to the uh, committee's positions. Uh, and so the other thing I need to alert you to is that we will adjourn directly from executive session and not return to open session.